So we're talking about antiderivatives. Um, last time we had sort of a, a, a little chart of basic antiderivatives, which I hope that you remember. These really, in time, you should have them totally memorized. And maybe you already do. I mean, they're not, they're not all that complicated. The most important one is x to the n. If you have just the power of x, the antiderivative of that is 1 over n plus 1 times x to the n plus 1. Plus c, of course, the antiderivative always involves a plus c, which is usually not very important and kind of a pain to just remember every time. Although, um, in real world problems, the, the c becomes important. We're going to do some examples like that today. Um, this works uh, when n is not negative 1. All right, n equal negative 1 is a special case. You can see right here, if the n was. Huh? What happened? Sorry, I don't know why that, I didn't touch anything. Um, hey, you can see right here, you're gonna have a problem if n equals negative one because the denominator will be zero, which is not allowed. So there is a special rule if n is negative one. So this is the special rule for x to the minus one, also known as one over x, that's the same thing. And it is, why am I saying this? Sorry, it's this. I, I didn't mean to talk about that. This is something uh, we haven't talked about, the, the natural log of x. I'm, I'm mixing up with my other, teaching one of the other calculus sequences also, in which case we do uh, make a big deal out of this rule. How about I'll just, this is a true fact. Maybe I'll just uh, do that. Actually, in this class, you may have noticed, I don't know if you noticed, why, aren't, why did we never talk about e to the x or the natural log of x? I don't know if you ever heard of these things, but um, those are covered in detail in, uh, in the second semester in Calc 2, which is why I've never mentioned any of that stuff. That rule right there is, is a super important rule, but actually we're not ever going to talk about it, so you don't have to know that. I shouldn't have mentioned it. I, um, I have just been not mentioning it all semester long. Um, the other important rules here that we talked about are just about um, the trig functions, all right? So, the antiderivative of cosine x is sine of x plus c. That's because, remember what the antiderivative means? It means a function whose derivative is the first thing. So this line is true. The, um, the antiderivative of cosine is sine. That's true because the derivative of sine is cosine. Um, and of course, the derivative of this constant will go away. That's why, that's why you have the plus c over here in the first place. Anyway, uh, sine of x, the antiderivative is minus cosine of x. And you just have to keep straight those minus signs. It can be confusing, but um, I hope we can all keep it straight. One other thing that I wrote in my, in my little chart last time was if I have just a constant over here, I got a number all by itself, the antiderivative of just a constant is kx plus c. So when you have just a constant and you take the antiderivative, what you get is that same constant times x, all right? These are the basic antiderivatives that everybody should know. The one in the brackets there is, is super important, but we'll get into that in Calc 2. All right. What I said at the end last time is for sums and constant multiples, everything adds up nicely. This is what we said at the very end last time. Everything adds up nicely. What I mean by that is you can just, uh, if you have a bunch of stuff added together, you can just take the antiderivative by doing the antiderivative on each separate part of it. So if I had something like 8x to the 5 plus 7x to the 10 minus 2x plus 3, if this was my original function f of x, then the antiderivative is you just go down the list there and you do the antiderivative each time and you add up the answers and those coefficients, the 8, the 7, the 2, they just stay as coefficients in front of the answer. So this 8x to the 5 turns into 8 times 1 over 6x to the 6. So just use the rule that was the first one in that, in that little chart that I had. If you have just a power of x, you increase the power by 1, and then you divide out in front by the new power. All right, 7x to the 10 becomes 7 times 1 over 11x to the 11. 
minus 2x becomes 2 times 1 half x squared. That's because you think of this x as x to the power 1. And I do this thing. Increase the power by 1 and divide by the new exponent. And then the 3 becomes 3x. That, was la that last rule right here. You have just a constant. The antiderivative is that same constant times x. All right. This is the antiderivative. I've got to put plus c. If you like, you can simplify that. Or some people like to write these in a slightly different form, and that's fine with me. Some people like to write instead of 1 6 x to the 6, you could just write x to the 6 divided by 6. And that's fine with me. All right. I'm just going to leave it like that. Any questions about that? OK, what I want to do uh, today is some slightly harder antiderivatives, although they're not going to be super hard. But um, often, we need to rewrite first. This is just like when you're doing the, uh, the derivative, right? Now, we use uh, some fancy tricks with the derivative, like the, the, uh, the product rule, the quotient rule, the chain rule. You don't really have things like that for the antiderivative. There's some things like that, but they're not called by the same names, and they work out very differently in practice. But we still have the uh, basic trick that you do with derivatives is rewriting things in terms of powers. So we want powers of x whenever possible. All right. Uh, for example, if I have this function, f of x is 4 over x squared plus the square root of x. I want to rewrite this in terms just of powers of x. So when I see that first one there, I don't like this division here. Division by x squared is not something that you can handle very easily when you're doing the antiderivative. So I'm going to rewrite the same thing again. Anyone want to suggest how could I rewrite 4 divided by x squared? What do you think? 4x to the minus 2. 4x to the minus 2. Yeah, so this is one rewriting trick that you know from the derivative. You would have done that if you were doing the derivative also. You should have done the same trick. Uh, power of x in the denominator can be re rewritten as a negative exponent. And what about the square root of x? Everybody knows. Square root of x is the same thing as x to the 1 half. All right. This is not the antiderivative. That's just the same thing again. I simplified it. And now I can do the antiderivative by doing the thing with the exponents. You go down the list each time you increase the exponent by 1 and then divide in front by the new exponent. So my antiderivative now, I'm going to go down here, go across. First of all, the 4 stays like it is as a coefficient. And then x to the minus 2, I increase the exponent by 1. It becomes x to the negative 1. And then I divide out front by the new exponent just like that. All right, 1 over negative 1, x to the negative 1. And then, same idea for x to the 1 half. Again, we add 1 in the exponent. 1 half plus 1 is 1 and a half, which is, you could write as 3 halves. And then out front, 1 over 3 halves. Also known as 2 thirds, right? You can do the reciprocal of that if you want to, but whatever. I'm not focusing on that at this point. All right. If you like, you can, you can simplify a lot of this. This is negative 4x to the minus 1, and then, like I said, 2 thirds x to the 3 halves, if you want. Although either of those lines is the correct answer for the antiderivative. It's just the first one is kind of awkwardly unsimplified. Any questions about that one? All right, I got one more. How about... Again, find the antiderivative of this thing. 3 sine x plus 8x plus x squared over root x. All right. This is another one where you will want to rewrite the original thing. Although, actually, when I look at 3 sine x, that's not really a problem. That you, you don't have to rewrite that. The 3 will stay like it is. And then the integral or the antiderivative of sine x is minus cosine of x. But uh, what about the other part? This part here. I think we could do with some rewriting. So in the first step, I'm not going to do antiderivatives. I'm just rewriting everything. So I keep the first part the same. Uh, and then this part, maybe I'll just start by writing this as a one-half power, right? That's always pretty much always a good idea in this class. Square roots should be written as 
one half powers. Any ideas about this? Can we do anything to simplify that? Rewrite it so that uh, I mean, principally, what I don't like about it is the is that this big fraction, the division. I don't like. Uh, what can we do about that? Yeah. I can, or you can do like x to the negative one half, and then distribute it, and the x's will they won't like cancel, but they'll like simplify a little. Bit. Yeah, yeah, a little something will happen. So what she says is. Oops, sorry. That 3 sine x is just going to stay the same for a while because it's already simplified enough. But I'm trying to resimplify the second part. Uh, she suggested we do like this. Right? Promote the uh, denominator upstairs. You have to make the exponent negative. And then distribute that thing, I think is what she said. Like so. And when you do that, the exponents will add, right? Because that's what happens when you multiply two powers of x. So 8x, I think of this as being x to the 1. 8x to the 1 times x to the minus a half. You add the exponents, and the new exponent is just 1 half, because it's 1 minus a half. So this is going to be 8x to the half. And then plus x squared times x to the minus a half will be x to the power, you know, 2 minus a half, which is 1 and a half, which is 3 halves. So that's just x to the 3 halves. And this is the end of the simplifying, all right? Now it is in a format which is convenient to take the antiderivative. So after all that, that's the original thing that I started with. The antiderivative then is, uh, like I said way at the beginning, 3 sine x is going to become 3 times negative cosine x. And then plus, you do the other guys. So 8x to the 1 half gives me 8 times 1 over 3 halves x to the 3 halves. And then plus x to the 3 halves, I increase the power by 1. It becomes uh, 5 halves up there, right? 3 halves plus another 2 half will be 5 halves. So this is x to the 5 halves and then 1 over 5 halves in front. And that's the antiderivative. Right? Sometimes you got to simplify the original thing before taking the antiderivative. And I hope you can keep it straight when which of these steps I tried to be clear about which of these steps represents the original thing still versus when do I switch over to the the big uh, the antiderivative. Right? I hope you keep it straight too. All right. Great. So I want to do two sort of uh, simple uh, problems which demonstrate the, the importance of the plus C. The, in all of these examples that we've done so far, the plus C really doesn't matter at all. But it is a fact that when you take the antiderivative, there are actually many possible antiderivatives. Uh, the terminology we used last time is like this one here that I wrote is called the general antiderivative. But there are other ones which have specific values for this uh, extra constant, and those are called par particular antiderivatives. This is a, uh, a general one. It, it refers to all of the different possible antiderivatives. But uh, in the real world, you actually usually want to only focus on one particular, specific, particular antiderivative. So anyway, let's try a couple like that. Here is. An example, find the particular antiderivative of, for this function, f of x equals 3 sine x, which has big F of 0 equals 2. All right? So, uh, like I just said, when you find the antiderivative, there are many different antiderivatives, which all have different values for that, that C there. This extra condition here, which I wrote this, this part here, this part lets us uh, solve for the C, the value of C in the antiderivative, all right? Usually, I don't give you that extra bit of information there, f, big F of 0 equals 2. But if I do give you that bit of information, then you can use that to, so, to figure out what the, the C is, like actually give it a specific value. This is sometimes called an initial condition. 
initial condition because I'm telling you what the what the value is at x equals zero. Um, anyway, let's see if we can do it. It's not hard to do if you know what you're doing. So first of all, find um, first I'm gonna find the general antiderivative. That's the one which has the plus c in it. And in this example, it's easy enough. It's just 3 sine x. We just did this as part of the other example. The general antiderivative will be minus 3 cosine x plus c, right? The integral, or sorry, I keep saying integral. This is another word for the antiderivative. Uh, the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. So the antiderivative of 3 sine x will be negative 3 cosine x. And they got to put the plus c. So first we find the general antiderivative. And then next, we plug in um, f of 0 equals 2, i.e., what that means is you plug x equals 0 and set it all equal to 2, right? This says, what, like what that means, f of 0 equals 2, what that means is if I plugged in x equals 0, then it would all uh, add up to 2, or the answer would be 2, right? So what that means is you're going to plug in x equals 0, and then set the whole thing equal to 2. And this will let you to solve for the c. So it will say minus 3 cosine of 0 plus c equals 2, right? I plugged in x equals 0, and I set it all equal to 2. And then this, if, you're, if you've done everything right, this has no more x's in it. The only unknown in this equation is c, and so you can solve for the c. Solve for c. How we do it? Well, you got to know what is the 3 times cosine of 0. Anyone remember cosine of 0? You can show me the fingers. It's 1, yes. As soon as I say you can show me the fingers, that pretty much means the answer is 1 or 0. Like the, It's not, you know, root 2 over 2 or something. Yeah, cosine of 0 is 1. So this says minus 3 times 1 plus c equals oops, 2. So negative 3 plus c equals 2. c equals 5, I guess. All right, we're basically done here, although the question, so remember the question said, find the particular antiderivative. So it should look like this, only with some specific value for c, and apparently that value is 5. So my final answer is not just c equals 5. So my final answer is the particular antiderivative, the one that they asked us for, is f of x equals minus 3 cosine x plus 5, right? So this is a, an example of a problem where the plus c is kind of the whole point of this problem, right? The, in this case, the antiderivative, finding the antiderivative, just getting to here is pretty easy. Uh, the rest is pretty easy, too, but you've got to know how to do it. All right. Let's do another one like this, and then we'll move on to something uh, a little bit different. This is more, uh, a more, you know, realistic, I suppose, real world kind of a uh, word problem. Let's say I, um, I have a rocket. This is not immediately unrealistic, but um, let's say I have a rocket and my rocket uh, starts at rest, as rockets do. Uh, and then it begins accelerating when it, you know, goes, it's going straight up. Uh, then begins accelerating at, let's say, 3 meters per second squared. It just has a constant acceleration, 3 meters per second squared. And I would like you all to give me functions for its um, velocity and position. All right. So this is a kind of a physics type example. And I'm, I don't care how much physics you know. What you need to know is that the um, velocity is the derivative of the position. These are things we've talked about many times before. So I'll call this you know, velocity. I'll call V of t. All right. The position, as usual, I will call s of t. And then the, um, the acceleration, I will call a of t. 
And as we've done, uh, we, we've talked about these things in the past when we were talking about the derivative. Um, we know, for example, v of t is the derivative, I'll just write it in words, of f of t, right? And a of t is the derivative of v of t, all right? So if I tell you the position function, you can find the velocity by taking the derivative, and then you can find the acceleration by taking the derivative uh, again of that, all right? This is kind of the opposite. In this problem, I told you the acceleration, and it is your job to determine the velocity and the position, all right? This, I don't know if this seems like obscure to you, but actually, especially if you're talking about rockets, this is a more realistic situation because there is no good, um, there's no good like physical instrument that you can use to measure the velocity of a rocket. Um, like you can't put a speedometer on the wheels or something because it doesn't, it doesn't have wheels. Uh, especially if your rocket is, is in space, there's nothing actually that you can do to measure its velocity because it's not interacting with anything as it travels. It's not like rolling on the ground or anything like that. Um, there's no like fixed reference frame to, to judge the velocity from. But you can always measure the acceleration of the rocket just if you know sort of how it works. When I push the button, it makes the engine go, and you know how powerful the engine is, and so you can tell what the acceleration is. So this, this problem um, in which you know what the acceleration is, but you don't know what the velocity is, that's actually pretty realistic uh, in the real world. Um, I happen to know this is also how, um, how uh, any kind of uh, motion controlled thing works, like the Wii remote or other kinds of uh, shake your phone to make it do something. Those are all based on an instrument inside there called an accelerometer, which measures how fast it is accelerating. And the, uh, the computer inside can determine the velocity of the thing, but it only determines it by doing antiderivatives of the acceleration, because the acceleration is what's being measured directly. Um, anyway, uh, let's see if we can do this. So um, we start with the acceleration. The acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. Rather than doing this as a derivative, take the derivative of the velocity, you get the acceleration. We're going to do it backwards. So that means that v of t is the antiderivative of a of t, right? This is how we are going to find the velocity. Because I said what the acceleration is, you can find the velocity by doing the antiderivative. And we're also going to find the position S of t is the antiderivative of v of t, right? So once we have the velocity, we can take the antiderivative again and find the, uh, the function for the position. All right. So anyway, our job is to find the velocity and the positions. So I'm going to say we have the acceleration function, first of all, is just a constant. Three, right? I said um, when the when the when the rocket starts going, it has a constant acceleration of three. All right. Uh, so let's see if we can find the velocity. This is the antiderivative of just you know a of t equal three. So v of t. What do you say? This will be just the antiderivative of three, which is. 3, yeah, 3x, he said. I have a, anyone say something slightly different? Very slightly different? Plus c, yes. I'm going to say that too. This is a picky thing, but I'm going to say 3t, right? It's three times the name of the variable, which in this problem is t rather than x. It's not always x. It's whatever the variable is. OK, so this is my velocity function. Now, I would like to try to solve for the plus c. Can we solve for the C? In order to solve for the C, you need the initial condition, which would say V of, uh, you need to plug in something like V of something equals, you know, something here, right? You should look back at the statement of the problem and see, did they tell you anything like that? Um, 
Did I tell you anything about the velocity at some other some uh, time is some specific velocity? Anybody see anything like that in there? Actually, I did tell you, although it's kind of couched in uh, in some words. Yeah. It starts at Yeah, I said it starts at rest. That's why I said that. The, the rocket starts at rest, which means the velocity, if you translate this into sort of mathematical terms, the velocity at time zero is zero, right? At time zero, the velocity is zero. That's because we start at rest. So I'm going to plug in v of zero equals zero. That's because I said starts at rest. That means at time zero, the thing is not moving means its velocity is zero. Okay, so up here I plug in. What that means is you plug t equals zero and then set it equal zero, right? So it says three times zero plus c equals zero. And then solve for c. It's just going to say c equals zero. All right, so that means my specific formula for the velocity is that 3t plus c, but the c is, uh, is 0. So this is the particular antiderivative now. And I hope you uh, agree with me that like in the real world, you, you usually almost always want a formula like this, which doesn't have the extra plus c. If, the, if you have the plus c, that's typically like not good enough to do answer whatever question you're trying to answer in the real world. You need the formula to be totally specific. All right. Okay, how about uh, S of T? Let's try that. So this is like the first part of my answer. Remember the question was, give me a formula for the velocity and the position. So that's the formula for the velocity. What about S of T? Uh, remember, I said before, S of T is the antiderivative of V of T, right? So we just do the antiderivative of that thing again. So. S of t is. Can someone say what's the antiderivative of 3t? Three times what do you say? 3 times t squared. Yeah, great. 3 over 2t squared plus c, of course. The 3 stays like it is, and then the t, which is t to the 1, becomes 1 half t squared. And then he put the you put the coefficients together, which is fine. All right, and now can I solve this for c? This is a little a little less clear in in the in the setup of the problem. I suppose I didn't say this, but I intended for you, your interpretation was that the rocket starts off sort of at height zero on the ground, right? That's I get, I suppose I didn't say that, but we start. I mean, I said it starts from rest. That kind of means it's like on the ground, right? I suppose it could be on top of a building or something, but let's say we start at height zero. So that means the thing that I'm going to plug in is again just s of zero equals zero. At time zero, the position is zero. And so we can plug that stuff in here. We plug t equals zero and set the whole thing equal to zero. 3 halves times 0 squared plus c equals 0. This is not, not terribly interesting because the c, again, will equal 0. And so that means the s of t is 3 halves t squared. And that's the second part of my answer. All right. I just wanted to do a, a real world example where it's clear what the, um, the initial condition is. If I didn't tell you the thing started at rest, then actually you, there's no way of knowing um, a formula for its velocity and position. This, by the way, is why, um, I don't know if you, uh, if you were into the, uh, the Wii. I played the Wii a lot with my kids. And at some point, um, after the Wii had been out for a while, they came out with uh, the Wii Motion Plus. You remember that thing? That was like a little add-on which, which made the, the motion tracking more accurate. But every so often as you were using it, it said, um, it said, please put the Wii remote down on a flat surface and wait for a few seconds for it to sort of stabilize or something. Um, 
the reason that you had to do that was to set an initial condition of the thing being at rest so that it could sort of recalibrate to get all the plus Cs right. Um, this business about initial conditions is really important. And it's kind of mathematically insurmountable. If you don't know the initial condition, there really is no way to tell what the, what the velocity or the uh, position is. All right. Excellent. This is actually all I want to say uh, for now about antiderivatives. I want to, I want to go on and just do a little bit from the next section. I don't think we need to do our whole time today. Um, I know it's right before break, and I have the urge to just leave early. But at the same time, I feel like you guys all showed up today. Would it be like an insult if we left early because you came? If we're going to leave early, you might as well have not come at all, right? I don't know. I have, I have mixed emotions about this. Uh, I want to reward you for coming, but um, I don't know. Like, I feel like if you, if you all showed up and then I said, hey, as your reward for showing up, I'm going to cancel class today. Isn't that kind of unsatisfying? I don't know. Really? My first, my first class today got canceled. Wouldn't that annoy you for having stayed? A bit. I don't know. That's it's philosophical questions that I ponder sometimes. Um, let's go another, you know, twenty minutes or so, and then uh, and that'll do it for today. Um, that what we just did. That's the end of the section about antiderivatives, uh, which is actually the end of the chapter. It's it's a little strange to me. They put. The last section of the, of the stuff about derivatives was the section on the antiderivative. And then we go on to the next chapter, which is also about antiderivatives. But um, anyway, what uh, we're going to talk about for the next little bit is areas. So uh, this will seem, especially what we're doing today, will seem completely different, not at all related to um, the antiderivative or the derivative for that matter. matter. But uh, I will just say, it seems completely unrelated, although it turns out there is completely unrelated. It turns out there is a deep relationship between finding areas of weird shapes and the antiderivative, although we're not going to see that relationship for, for quite a while. Um, they seem totally different, but actually there is a deep relationship. But anyway, what I want to talk about for the next, uh, well, for the rest of today, plus next time also. Um, finding areas of weird shapes. Uh, for example, um, you know, you could actually use what we're about to talk about to find the area of, of any shape you like. Um, when, you're a, when you're a kid, you know, you're, you learn certain specific shapes, the area of a rectangle, the area of a triangle, and you probably learned some other ones, the area of a circle. All of these are specific shapes where you just kind of memorize a custom formula for every different shape. And you just have to remember all the different formulas. But actually, we're going to talk about a general purpose method that you could use to find the area of any shape you can think of. Now, in practice, it's very hard to do this for most weird shapes. But um, that's what the, uh, the next sort of major topic is going to be. And this like I said, turns out to be very closely related with the antiderivative, although that will not be obvious at all in what we say for the next couple times. Uh, anyway, we're going to focus on shapes that have this, uh, this type, where you have a curve. It's not very interesting. I'll draw it like that. We're going to focus on shapes which are curved according to a function like this, all right? This weird curvy area in there. It's not super curvy, I suppose. It has three straight sides and then another side, which is a curve, all right? So we're going to focus on areas that are determined by a function. And in this uh, a setup like this, this is referred to as the area under the curve, that area right there, um, from A to B, if I call 
this little interval of x values, let's say it goes from x equal a up to x equal b, that you know, shaded, scribbled in region there, I'm going to refer to as the area under the curve from A to B. Now, not every shape looks like that. You know, this, uh, a shape like this does not look like the area under the curve of a specific function, right? But actually, if you really had to find the area of that shape, you could divide it into a bunch of um, pieces, each of which looks like the area under a function maybe like this, and then turn it sideways. Can I do that? No, it just rotates. Anyway, um, if you look at that one sideways, maybe cut this piece off, um, it, look, it will look like the area under the curve of a function. You'd have to do it in a, in a few different pieces. Anyway, um, we're not going to focus on totally weird shapes like that, although this will be a topic in Calc 2 to do some more exotic type shapes. But for now, I'm just going to focus on shapes that look like the area under a curve, like that picture right there. Um, and there is a basic sort of philosophical approach to finding the area of a curved region. Remember, uh, there is, you know, the way that kids are taught is just like, well, every, every area is different, children. And uh, every different kind of shape has its own formula that goes with it. And that, that's true. But... What we're going to try to do is a general purpose method, which will work in theory for any shape at all. And the basic approach is to cover the area with little rectangles. Cover the area with little rectangles, and I will say rectangles or other shapes although we are usually going to think of it in terms of rectangles. Cover the area with little rectangles or other little shapes. Why use rectangles? Because everybody knows how to find the area of a rectangle. So the idea is that picture there, maybe I'll try and just sort of scribble on here a little bit. We're going to do this in, in, in some amount of detail, but in this picture, the idea would be um, I'm going to Sorry, the general strategy, I'm going to divide up this interval of x values into a bunch of little bits. And then on each bit, I'm going to draw in sort of a, a, a skinny, tall rectangle that goes up here. And as close as is possible with a rectangle, fits into the curve. Now, the top of the curve is, is curvy, so the rectangles are not going to exactly fit the picture here. But they'll be pretty close. So these ones over here are going to overhang a little bit. So I'm trying to do my best, right? And the idea is if you were to add up those blue rectangle areas, which you definitely could do because everybody knows the area of a rectangle, then the area of the blue rectangles added all up together will be pretty close to the area of the curved region. That's the idea behind this. Um, that when you, if you ever do this, what you're doing really is just an approximation. Switch back to here. So cover the area with little rectangles and then add up the rectangle areas. All right. When you do this, what you're going to get is an approximation to the true area. Approximation, but we can get the uh, true area by doing a fancy limit. We're not going to get to that today, but for, for now, sorry, I'm off the bottom. Um, for today, we're just going to do some very simple examples where you add together not so many rectangles. That picture I drew up there, I, I don't know how many rectangles that was. You need to use a lot of rectangles in order for your approximation to be very accurate, right? Because if you only use, say, three or four rectangles, they're not going to fit very nicely with the, the curvaceous nature of this curve, right? But if you were to use, say, 100 rectangles, they would fit quite nicely with the curve here or uh, you know, a million rectangles. Actually, this picture 
is appearing to you on a screen, which everybody knows the screen is made up of rectangular uh, pixels, right? So actually already the picture, if you were to look really, really closely, it already is made up of rectangles. It only looks curvy. Anyway, uh, what I'm saying is if the rectangles are small enough, then it will be very, very close to the actual area of the curve, uh, indistinguishable from the true area. That's the basic idea behind using calculus to find areas of things. And I said, you can get the true area by doing some fancy limits. That's what this has to do with calculus at all. Like all, all the fundamental ideas of calculus are based on limits. The derivative is a certain kind of limit. And this also is another kind of fancy limit that you can do. Take the limit of uh, adding up all those rectangles. But for now, we're not going to do any of those limits. Let's just do some very basic examples. You have to understand the sort of fundamentals before you try and get fancy with the limits. So let's try for, um, this is my favorite simple example of finding the area of a curved region. For this, on the interval from 0 to 1. So the picture I'm talking about is um, x squared, which is just the parabola but only going over to one here, come on now. And the y value at one also happens to be one just because one squared is one. So the y value there is one. And I would like to try to make some estimations for that uh, area there, which looks kind of like a triangle, but it has a, a curvy side, all right? This is the area under the curve of a parabola. And let's, uh, let's try and do this by um, making, let's make four rectangles. So this estimation will not be, be terribly accurate to the true area under the curve, but just for the sake of doing an example that's not so hard to do. Uh, I'm going to make four rectangles. And uh, there are a few different ways you can draw the rectangles that we're going to talk about. I'm going to draw these ones. I'm going to make four rectangles with the um, heights impacting the curve on the right side. I mean right as opposed to left. So what I mean by that is I'm going to divide the region here into um, four little bitty bits, which is to say I cut it in half and then in half again. And then the rectangles which I draw, I'm going to make them go up so this, for, uh, so the rightmost rectangle here, I'm going to make it go up, all the way up like that. This is what I meant when I said the heights of the rectangles, they touch the curve on the right side. So this rectangle right here, its rightmost side hits the curve. The next one over would look like this. It hits the curve on its right side. The next one looks like this. And then the final one looks like this. All right. They each hit the curve on the right-hand side of each rectangle. Um, and in this case, we can actually like work out the numbers. Let's actually try and add these up. This is not hard to do, although it's, it's kind of a pain to do if you don't have a calculator, but it's not uh, really difficult. So let's add the rectangle areas. All right, everybody knows the uh, area of a rectangle is the base times the height. So what it's going to do is um, we'll add up base times the height. I wrote height here. I put an R in there. The height. We add up the base times the height, and there's going to be four of them, right? So it'll be like four things added together, each one being the base times the height. And I would say in these rectangles, the bases are all the same, right? The heights are different, but the bases are all the same. And what is, what's the, uh, the width of the base in this case? Yeah? One yeah, it's one fourth, because I started with the interval from zero to one, and I divide it into four pieces. So the base, each time, is actually there's a special notation. We always call this, in a problem like this, not one, one fourth. And just because I'm going to use my calculator to do this, I'm going to put 0.25. This, uh, the base width is always going to be called delta x. That's this distance right here. 
the width of each one of those rectangles. They all have the same width. It's one fourth in this example because I started with a, uh, the total width was one and I cut it into four pieces. All right. And then what about the heights? The heights are given by the function values, right? They, they are, the heights are the y values of these four points. And these four points, you know, you can figure this out on the picture. They are 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and 1, all right? And the heights of each of those rectangles, sorry, I'm scrolled out. The heights are given by the y values of those four points of 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and 1, right? And how do we find the y values? Well, you just plug them into the function. The function is y equals x squared in this case, all right? So we get the heights. So the heights are 0 0.25 squared, 0 0.5 squared, 0 0.75 squared, and 1 squared, right? You're adding together the heights. The heights are given by the function values, which is, in this example, squaring. OK, can we do this? So sort of put it all together. We're going to add up four things. Each one will be the base times the height. All the bases are 0.25, and the heights are those four numbers. So the total rectangle area. So the rectangle area is. I'm going to add together each time um, the base times the height. Actually, in our book, when they always write these, they always write the height times the base. I hope you don't mind. So it's going to be the first height was 0.25 squared times the base, which was 0.25. And then the next height was 0.5 squared times the base, 0.25. And then the next height, 0.75 squared times the base, 0.25. And then finally, 1 squared times the base, 0.25. All right? This is the height. This is the base each time. Sorry. And this, I typed all this into my calculator. This is what computers are good for. 0.46875 is what I got. All right. So this is an estimation of the area under the curve there. Using four rectangles. So what this is called is, this is you know, in a, in a homework problem or something, what I just did would be described in this way. This would be um, estimate the area using four rectangles on the right endpoints, right as opposed to left. All right. So if they say those words, this is what you do, what I just did. Uh, and there's actually a, a notation that our book uses. They call this R4, 4, 6, 8, 7, 5. R meaning the right and 4 because there were four rectangles there. All right. And just in our one last thing to say, I keep on saying put the rectangles on the right side. You could also put them on the left side. Let's just see what happens in this example if I put the rectangles on the left side. Oh, can I just say one more thing? This number, 0.46, um, is not the true area under the curvy shape. In fact, in this example, just because we know what the picture looks like, this number is an overestimation, right? Because these rectangles are bigger than the, than the true area under the red shape. This is an overestimate. In this particular example, it's an overestimate. It's not always an overestimate. Sometimes it would be an underestimate. Just because I know what the curve the shape of the curve is, I can tell this one's going to be an overestimation. So let's try on the left endpoints. Uh, what that means on the picture is my curve does this. And this time, I'm going to draw my rectangles still dividing into four bits. But this time, they go up and hit the curve on the left like that, like that like that. And this one, actually, this is kind of a, a stupid one. The first one, it has like height zero because um, it's already, you know, there is no height if you go up to the, the left end point is at the origin already. This can happen sometimes that the rectangles have heights zero. All right. 
Now, I, I want to try to do this without rethinking the whole thing. What is different, you should ask yourself, about this, this version of the problem versus the previous version? Well, we always have the base times the height, the delta x and whatever. Uh, I would say the bases are the same, right? The delta x is the same. In this case, it's still 0.25, right? What is different? Um, look at these, these points here, these four points. If you looked at the previous picture, I hope you can see both of these pictures at the same time maybe. They are they're the same points again. It's just that in this example, the last one was this one all the way up at one, and we sort of skipped the, the, the first one. We omitted this first point, but we included this one. In this version of the example, these three points in the middle are the same. It's just we skipped, uh, we, we omit the last point, and we do include the first point. All right, so the delta x is the same. The heights this time are, we begin with 0 squared, and then 0.25 squared, and then 0.5 squared, and then 0.75 squared. They're mostly the same. It's just in the previous example, we also had 1 squared, and we didn't include the 0 squared. This time, we do include the 0. And we do not include the 1, all right? But otherwise, it's all the same. So this area then, or this estimate, estimate, approximation is what I wanted to say. Is This one is called L4. The other one, remember, was R4. That was dividing into four rectangles using the right side. This one is called L4. Anyway, it's, it's, it's basically the same, only the heights you use are slightly different. I do include a 0, and I do not include the 1 that was in the previous example. So it's going to be the first height times delta x plus the second height times delta x plus the third height times delta x plus the last height times delta x. And this I plugged into my calculator and I got, so this one, according to the picture, we expect this to be an underestimation of the true area. I got uh, 0.21875, which is quite a bit less than the, uh, the other one, right? Before I said it was 0.46, this time I said it's 0.21. That's because the uh, earlier example was an overestimation. This is now an underestimation. So the true value of the area is, is somewhere in between those two numbers. All right. How could we get a more accurate approximation? You would use more rectangles. Like I said before, here I only used four of them, but if I use, say, ten rectangles, they would be a lot closer to the actual curvy curve. And if I use a hundred, they'd probably be indistinguishable to the eye. Right? That's the idea if you want your approximation to get better. All right, we'll get into that kind of stuff next time. I think this will do for us for today. Thank you for your continued attention.